Welcome to Summit Online. Summit Online is a live stream of our Sunday morning worship and teaching from our Capitol Hills campus. The Summit is one church in many locations, so we're glad you're joining us this morning. If this is your first time watching, we are so glad that you're here and we would love to connect with you. Do us a favor and pull out your phone and text the word WELCOME to 33933. We'll ask you to fill out some information and then someone from our team will reach out to help you take your next step here with us. Our mission here at the Summit Church is to create a movement of disciple making disciples right here in RDU and around. Welcome to Summit Online. Summit Online is a live stream of our Sunday morning worship and teaching from our Capitol Hills campus. The Summit is one church in many locations, so we're glad you're joining us this morning. If this is your first time watching, we are so glad that you're here and we would love to connect with you. Do us a favor and pull out your phone and text the word WELCOME to 33933. We'll ask you to fill out some information and then someone from our team will reach out to help you take your next step here with us. Our mission here at the Summit Church is to create a movement of disciple making disciples right here in RDU and around the world. We want you to be a part of that. So we hope today's teaching is a helpful resource as you grow in your relationship with Jesus. If you've been joining us for a while, then why not take a moment and share Summit Online with a friend? Click the share tool on YouTube or just copy the link and text it to a friend. We can't keep this to ourselves, right? Now, who's ready to worship? Crank up your volume, let's sing. Summit family, how's it? I was about to say, how's it going? I'm sorry, don't mind. How many glad to be in the house of the Lord one more time this morning? Yeah. Hallelujah. That's what I like to hear. Well, listen, first off, smile, smile. Look at that. It's the day that the Lord has made, and we must rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, now that y'all smiling, let's stand all over the room. Hallelujah. I want to sing this song. It's a familiar song. Uh, but for some people, they may not be familiar with it. And so not only will you not be familiar with it, you also don't know this version. So I want to teach you this version real quick. Simple part, okay? Let me see how well y'all can sing this morning. Say, ah, 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 Okay? It's the whole thing. You try that with me? One, two, sing. Ah, sing, y'all. Ah, Good. Ah. Y'all should be on stage with us. Come on, let's sing this again. <laughs> Do me a favor. You lift your hands for a moment. Just say, Lord, have your way this morning. Yeah. It's a real simple prayer this morning. Hallelujah. Next part of it. Ah, ah, ah. Come on, with your hands lifted, you can sing that. Sing it with me, church. Ah, 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 yeah. Ah, Y'all sound good. Sing it one more time. Say, ah, 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 yeah. ah, 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 All right, let's see if you remember this song this way. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare your our living hope. Say, ah, your presence, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. I've tasted. 
didn't sing of the sweetest of love where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone yeah I that Holy Spirit you are welcome Holy Spirit come on this is your prayer this morning is it Holy Spirit Holy Spirit have your way Jesus Holy Spirit Holy Spirit you are come on singers help them sing that's it Holy Spirit Holy Spirit you are Holy Spirit have your way Holy Open our hearts to you this morning, Jesus. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Oh, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Hey, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. You're welcome in my heart. in this room. And the 
reason why we invite him into our hearts is because we might need something from him or we're looking for something from him. And now I'm a firm believer that if he's done something for me before, there's no reason why I shouldn't be able to reach for him again. Every day, every week, I need more and more of Christ, amen? Just sing a little bit of this song. It says, walking around these walls. Walking around these walls. I thought by now they'd fall. But you have never failed me yet. Thank you, Jesus. Waiting for change to come. Knowing the battles won. For you have never failed me yet. This Come on, morning. church. It's a sacrifice of prayer. Can you sing this morning? Say your promise. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. Come on, we're just talking to him this morning. I'm still. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never. You never. Fail me at Jesus. Come on, sing it out. I know the night won't last. I know the night won't but Your last. word will come to pass. Your word will come to and my heart will sing your praise again.
Hallelujah. One more time, church. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithful. Yeah. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. I'm still in your. This is my confidence. You never said again. Your promise still stands on. Your promise still. Great is your faithfulness. Morning by morning, our new mercies. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. Still in your. This is my confidence. This is my confidence. Go on. Lift your hands in the room. Say, your promise still stands. Say, your promise. Great is, great is. You've been so faithful, faithful. You've been consistent, Lord. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. This is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. Say, you've never failed me yet. You've never failed. I'm a living witness that you've never failed. You've never. I'm standing here as a living testimony saying you've never, you've never failed. I should have died a long time ago, but you've never failed me. You've never. I should have been in jail still, but you've never failed me. You've never failed. My children should be sick, but God, you never fail me. You never fail. My loved ones should be locked up, but God, you never fail me. You never. My bills might not have been paid, but God, you never fail me. You never fail. You never testimony this morning that God has always done something for you. Can you celebrate and give him praise this morning? Come on, clap your hands and give him glory. Hallelujah. 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 Church family, he's faithful, isn't he? In the dark places, in the uncertainties. Can you say with me, you've never ever failed me, God. I mean, I believe that. I see that this morning all around this room. It's good to see your smiling faces. My name's Robbie. I serve as one of the campus elders here. You guys can go ahead and take a seat as we run through some announcements. Uh, we're gonna continue to worship now through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Uh, all that we give here at Summit goes to all that we do. We have a one fund approach to missions and ministry. So the, the money that you give goes to all that we do here at the church in RDU and all around the world. Just wanna say thank you for investing in the kingdom of God. God here. There's three ways that you can give. Number one, you can text the number. See, y'all know it. I wake up, I'm like 33933. I might forget some numbers, but I'm never forgetting that one. You can text 33933, text the word give. Uh, you can go to summitchurch.com forward slash give. You can make a one-time gift there. You can go crazy, set up a recurring gift, plan your giving. I mean, I don't know. I'm just a financial planner. I can't tell you what to do. Um, you can also, if you brought your gift, you can drop it off in the buckets on the way out. Uh, if it's your first time to get today with us uh, as our guest, we don't want you to feel compelled to give today. In fact, we have a gift for you. So make sure if you haven't already that you stop by the first time guest table on the way out of church, okay? So I've got two really exciting announcements. That's why I'm up here today to tell you about two really exciting things. Are y'all with me for those two things? All right, awesome. First thing is next Saturday, June 18th, we've got a Juneteenth Freedom Day celebration and it's gonna be really awesome. A couple people excited about it. We're partnering with Word of God Fellowship and we're gonna be down at Moore Square in downtown Raleigh from 11 to two this coming Saturday. Now let me tell you something, let me just get real with you for a second, let me get personal. I went to my first Juneteenth celebration last year and I just want you to know church family, it, it really did, it had a profound impact on my life. It had a profound impact on the way that I, for the first time in my life, understood that holiday and what it meant to so many. 
And, and I just want to encourage you to come and be a part of it. It's going to be from 11 to 2. They're going to have inflatables. They're going to have food trucks. They're going to have live music. They've got street parking for the select few. They've got a couple parking garages lined out. You don't even have to RSVP. So for the half of you that's going to stress you out, for the other half, you weren't going to RSVP anyway, so no worries. So come down, be with us that day. Let me just tell you, you know, really quick, from my heart to you, I don't think that showing up is the finish line but I do think it's part of living a multi-ethnic life. And so I wanna encourage you to come, come be part of that with us. Come show up Saturday, learn, grow, and just be with our community together. So that's coming up this Saturday. Who's with me? A couple people, all of you, okay. I'll see you all on Saturday. I'm excited about that. So at this time, I've got one more really exciting thing for us. I'd like to invite up a special group. uh, And as they're making their way on stage, this is our inaugural Capitol Hills Deacon class that's coming to join me. We're going to commission our first ever deacons here at the Summit Church at at Capitol Hills campus. And I want to tell you, as they're making their way up on stage, I want to tell you who they are really quick and what they do. So who they are. Deacons are men and women who are qualified and commissioned to care for and serve God's people in unique ways. In Acts chapter six, the first deacons are commissioned because the church at Jerusalem is just completely overwhelmed with all the needs. In fact, there are widows who are, who are not getting the care that they need. And so the church of Jerusalem commissions seven individuals to go and begin to meet those needs. And it's special. The, Acts chapter six says that, that deacons are, um, that, they, that they live lives that are full of the spirit and full of wisdom and that they're of good reputation. And we believe that to be true of each of these individuals. And then what do they do? So the first deacons that were commissioned in the Bible were there to distribute food and care for widows. And and although those needs continue to arise today and they continue to meet those needs, what might you find our deacons doing day in, day out? Well, there's many things, but you might see them making hospital visits. You might see them creating crisis care plans for families that are in need. You might see them setting up meal food trains for families. You might see them um, caring for families after they've suffered a loss in their family. You might see them uh, helping with benevolence for those who are suffering in financial hardship. On the weekends, you'll see them all across this church in serving teams, recruiting and training volunteers, serving in different areas, international missions. You know, if I was to put it in short, you're gonna find wherever there's a need in the Summit Church, you're probably gonna see one of these deacons going about the work of deaconing and serving and caring for the body of Christ here. So um, I'm really excited to commission them today. Would you guys join me by just extending your hand as we pray and commission them to the work that God's already doing in their lives? God, we thank you for these deacons. I thank you that each of them radiates the living hope that they have in Jesus. God, thank you that you adopted them foremost as your sons and daughters, that you set your love on them and that you called them to this great task. God, we're, we're a growing church and we just have, we have needs all around us. And I thank you that you have uniquely, you've uniquely called each of these men and women to the work of serving and caring for the body. God, I pray that as Paul said in Colossians 1, that they would bear fruit in every good work that you have for them, God. I pray that they would be close to Jesus, that they would make much of him with their lives. God, that you would receive glory in our church because of the work that they do. God, we thank you for deacons. We thank you for our body of Christ. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Hi, we are Alex and Eve Choi, and we go to the downtown Durham campus. We have two boys, Nathan, 10 years old, and Jonah, eight years old. And we have just adopted our daughter, Tiffany, and she is six years old. In February, 2020, we found out that we were matched with Tiffany. And of course, this was two weeks before um, the pandemic shut everything down. After two years of nothing, we were overwhelmed. by just how much God can move when he wants to and chooses to. This country in Southeast Asia um, lifted all the COVID restrictions, I think late February, early March, 2022. We booked our tickets in the span of one week and it was just crazy. It's almost like we didn't have time to process which makes no sense because we've been waiting on it for four we've been years. For so long. <laughs> but to to actually meet her in person 
have a couple hours with the house nannies and then for her to be under our care immediately mm -hmm. was all very surreal. Overnight, mm -hmm. yeah. And then we take the elevator up to our room and starts, you know, our, our lives together. We were reminded uh, weekly, monthly, yearly, that just totally out of our control. And we had to really submit that God would provide. It's not the product at the end that we are trying to achieve, but his presence through the process that was important too. God really taught me in the last four years about how much we need him, how much his presence is what we need, and how his um, nearness to us is the thing we should desire the most. Um, there are some moments in the last four years that I don't know what Alex and I are doing. Um, we don't know how we got here. We're not sure how we ended up with a six-year-old, what needs she has, what her future looks like, what our family's future looks like. And when I go down that path too long, it gets overwhelming. And I have to stop and remind myself, um, whatever her future looks like, it will be God that redeems her. And it's not gonna be anything that Alex and I do or say, or um, it won't be us that save our, saves our children. It'll be God who saves us. Um, even though there are daily struggles. And there are daily struggles. God reminds us that not only is he in control, but he uh, reveals himself. And we have to remind ourselves that when he does reveal himself, to cling on to that. Well, some of the family, Alex and Eve, are faithful members over at our downtown Durham campus, the downtown Durham. What's up? Um, man, adoption, just what a beautiful physical picture of what God has done for us spiritually in Christ. Um, well, if you have your Bibles, I'm actually gonna invite someone up. Summer, come on up here. Can y'all say hi, Summer? Everybody say hi, Summer. Uh, Summer's actually gonna help us read our text for this morning. And so if you have your Bibles, here's what I want you to do. I want you to open it up to the very front, table of contents, okay? I don't want anybody to feel left out here. Table of contents, find the New Testament, and about halfway through the New Testament, you're gonna look for the book of Philemon, the book of Philemon, okay? So now nobody knows that you didn't know where the book of Philemon is, all right? So as you're making your way there, I'm normally the guy that asks you to stand for the reading. I'm not gonna ask you to stand this morning because we're actually going to read the entire book. Now, don't freak out. It's only 25 verses. Uh, also, this is church. We read the Bible, so sorry, I'm not sorry, okay? And so um, let's give our attention to Summer, and Summer's gonna read for us, all right, Summer? Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have, have him back forever. 
no longer as a bond servant, but more than a bond servant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And this is the word of God. Can we thank Summer? <clears throat> Great job. On uh, Thursday night, my man Tom read it. And after he was like, did I pronounce the names right? I was like, I don't know. That's why I had you read it. <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, Man, what an awesome book. We started this series a couple weekends ago. Pastor Brian kicked off our series through this short little book called Philemon. And some of you are like, I thought we were in Psalm 23. Uh, yes, we are, or we were. That ended last week. Uh, Pastor Brian told you to think of it like binge watching two of your favorite shows at the same time. So we can do it at church if that's all right. Uh, just as a way of reminder, I know we just read it, but it's a fascinating little story. Um, Philemon is just this rich, Jesus-loving guy who lives in Colossae, uh, the same Colossae that the book of Colossians was written to. And he's so rich that he actually has a household of servants or slaves. And one of those slaves' names is Onesimus. Well, apparently Onesimus got tired of being a slave. So he steals a bunch of stuff from Philemon's house to kind of fund his flea and he runs away to Rome. Well, on the run, he, Onesimus, runs into one of our favorite Bible buddies, who is the Apostle Paul. And not only do Onesimus and Paul meet, but Paul actually leads Onesimus to Christ. And so at some point, Paul's like, hey man, just tell me a little bit more about yourself, where you're from. And he comes to find out that Onesimus is a runaway slave who has funded his journey by stealing from his owner, Philemon which is kind of a fun little plot twist because not only does Paul know of Philemon, but Paul actually led Philemon to Christ as well, just like he did Onesimus. So what Paul does is he sends Onesimus back to turn himself into Philemon. And while he's heading back, Paul actually hands Onesimus this little letter to give to Philemon, this letter that is now called the book of Philemon. Does that make sense? See, this oft forgotten little book might be one of the most practical books in the entire Bible. It's been said that it far surpasses all the wisdom of the world. It's even written in its context at this time, the law actually permitted a master to execute a rebellious slave. But Philemon was a Christian. So here's his dilemma. If Philemon as a Christian chooses to punish Onesimus or even kill him, how would that affect his Christian testimony? However, if he chooses to forgive Onesimus for stealing from him and fleeing, what would the other masters or the other slaves think? So this is quite the predicament. And what this book challenges with us today, what it challenges Philemon with, and what it challenges with today is actually the same thing he was dealing with then. Will you and I choose to forgive someone who has wronged us. It's this book that's gonna challenge us as we talk today about forgiveness. I'm gonna go ahead and warn you, it's not gonna be easy. I know, because I've been wrestling with it all week. Forgiveness and reconciliation. A couple weekends ago, Pastor Brian showed us that in any broken relationship, there must be three things present in order for reconciliation to occur. He said, first, there has to be truth. Second, there has to be repentance. And third, there has to be grace or forgiveness. You gotta have all three of these or else it doesn't work, okay? Think about it like this. Um, a couple weeks ago, we, we've had this slew. We have four kids, seven and under, and we have three of them that have like back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back birthdays. And so we were making cupcakes for one of my kids' birthdays. And my wife had set it out on the counter and uh, she was up getting ready or something. And I'm like, I mean, I can do cupcakes. How hard can this be? Now I can grill. Like if you need me to grill, I'm your boy, okay? Like I'm not even unashamedly, like I know how to grill. I know how to cook. Baking is not my thing, okay? So I'm like, how hard can this be? It's just like cupcakes or like it's the flour stuff. It's water, it's egg, it's... Uh, what? 
See, literally, this is how bad it is. <laughs> There's something else. There is another ingredient. And so I'm like, how hard can this be? So I start making this stuff and I'm like, man, this is kind of thick. Like, why does this feel so thick? Let's just add some more eggs. Let's see how this goes. And so I'm stirring this junk and stirring this junk and I put it in the little cupcake things and I put it in the oven. And I kid you not, my wife comes downstairs within like one minute and she's like, did you make the cupcakes? I'm like, I did, you're, you're welcome. <laughs> and she's like, why? That, no, it's, it's, and she starts going down this list. She's like, did you add this? I'm like, yes, I added this. She's like, did you add this? I'm like, of course I added this. And then she opens up. She's like, babe, you did not add something. I'm like, babe, I added it. And I'm getting like real defensive. Like she's being patient with me. And she opens up things. She's like, you forgot something. She pulls them out. And lastly, she's like, did you add water? And I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> so uh, just like cupcakes, you got to have all the ingredients for this thing to work. Okay. For reconciliation to occur, we got to have all three. We got to have truth. We got to have repentance and we got to have reconciliation or forgiveness to have reconciliation, okay? So in this story, Paul represents truth. Paul, who writes the letter, he's the one who instructs Onesimus to go back and to make things right because reconciliation cannot happen unless we face what has happened, who we hurt, and tell the truth about the situation. Second, Onesimus represents repentance, Onesimus must go back and repay the damage he's done because repentance is not just confession with your mouth, it's a change of action in your life. And then third, Philemon, this is the one we're gonna look at today, represents grace and forgiveness. In any relationship breakdown, someone has been wronged and what this means is that if the relationship has any hope of being reconciled, someone must show grace by choosing to forgive. Forgiveness. Now, when I say that word, what or who comes to mind? Is it someone who betrayed you? Is it someone who lied to you? Maybe it's someone who lied about you. Maybe it's someone who mistreated you or took advantage of you. Maybe for you, you think about the remnants of a broken relationship, maybe with an old best friend or an estranged family member, a former business partner, or even a current coworker. Perhaps for you, it makes you think about a boyfriend that hurts you and then lied about you toward everybody else in your community. Got to imagine in a church this size, for some of you, it makes you think about a former spiritual authority in your life that abused their power. And so you've got some church hurt. And actually the reason you were at this church this morning is because you have fled some other church. An absolute epidemic in our world today is the father wounds that come. So maybe that's what you think about. Or maybe for you, it's an ex-spouse to whom this day you could fill the Grand Canyon with your irreconcilable differences. What relationship in your life has been devastated because of a deep hurt or a deep offense? And do you as a follower of Christ really need to forgive that person with the things they've done? Are we really called to forgive Everyone, all the time, especially people that don't deserve it at all. And if we're supposed to forgive them, then how are we supposed to do it? And before we get real practical here, I want to say two things to anyone who's been betrayed in a significant way. First, I want you to hear from me on behalf of your pastors and elders. I just want to say, I am so sorry. This is not the way the world was supposed to be. See, I don't know your particular situation, but I do know something of the relational pain and heartache that's caused by the sins of another. And I know how hard it is to even think about forgiving someone who's wounded you so deeply, much less actually forgive them. And one of the things I need you to know is that most of the ways I'm actually gonna apply this today is gonna be for, let's just call them common conflicts. That's the context for today's message, okay? My, my context today is not abuse. It's not persistent, unrepentant manipulation and control in a relationship. Is the gospel relevant to those situations? Absolutely, 100% yes. And I'm gonna try to show you a few ways throughout the sermon, but I just need you to hear from me up front. Priority one is always going to be physical safety. 
Because only when we triage that well can we get deeper into everything else that I'll be talking about. In other words, if you at any point begin to think to yourself, is he just up there saying that I should be a doormat and that I should just grin and bear it and take it for the sake of Jesus? Is that what he's saying that reconciliation is? My answer is absolutely not. Forgiveness does not ever mean that you become a doormat for Jesus, okay? So much damage has been done, especially in the church, by people pushing others around and using the word reconciliation as a weapon. So know that that's not the context for today. The second thing I want to say to you is that while we may not always be able to walk the road all the way to reconciliation, as followers of Jesus, we can always follow the path of forgiveness. Reconciliation, especially amongst believers, is always the goal. But reconciliation takes two people, one to forgive and one to repent. Forgiveness only takes one. And as followers of Jesus, God clearly, repeatedly, and emphatically calls us to forgive. It's all throughout the scriptures. Look at Ephesians chapter four, verse 32. Here's just a slew of them. It says, and being kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. We're to forgive others because we ourselves have experienced the forgiveness of God. Colossians chapter three, verse 13, it says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Again, we followers of Jesus who have received the forgiveness of God are to show that same forgiveness to others. Or how about this one, Matthew chapter six. This is in the Lord's prayer, which if maybe you you know this, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day our daily bread. Let us forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's how I learned it. Forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our trespasses. Have you ever thought about how this is written? As we forgive those who trespass against us. What if God forgave you only to the extent that you forgive others? See, as a Christian, if you've been wronged by someone, what is your role in making it right? Well, God just doesn't tell us that we should forgive. He actually provides us instructions on how to forgive. And so what I wanna do for you this morning is give you four questions that forgiveness asks. Four questions that forgiveness asks. And the order of these is very important, okay? Four questions that forgiveness asks. Here's the first one. The first question we should ask ourselves is, how can I glorify God in this situation? So you've been wounded. The first question you should ask is, how can I glorify God in this situation? No matter what situation you find yourself in, you can always glorify God in it. That's one of the things we've been looking at in Psalm 23, goodness in the middle. The middle insinuates that you are going through something. What you are going through could be that somebody has betrayed you. And what I want you to ask is, how can I glorify God in this? In fact, look at what Paul says to Philemon, beginning in verse four. He says, Philemon, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus. That's his vertical relationship. And I hear of your love and your faith for all the saints. That's horizontal. Verse six, Paul says, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us. Why? For the sake of Christ. I could also read for the glory of God. See, here's this guy, Philemon, who's been wronged. And Paul tells him right off the bat, he says, man, I'm so encouraged by your life because so far you have glorified God in your love for Jesus and your love for others. And you've done it, it says, for the sake of Christ. And he says, I pray that you will be able to keep doing that because you don't know it yet. But what I'm about to ask you to do, I'm about to ask you to forgive is about to be really hard. And so in order to do it well, you're gonna have to focus on how can I glorify God in this situation? And he tells him that because he knows that just like Philemon probably is prone to do, it's exactly what you and I are prone to do. See, when it comes to forgiveness, what we tend to do is to focus not on glorifying God, but we tend to focus on the response of the other person. Well, man, if they would just own up to their sins, then, then, then we could talk about forgiveness. 
Well, if they would just stop doing blank, then perhaps I could consider forgiveness in this relationship. If they could even just show the slightest bit of remorse, then we could talk about forgiveness. And forgiveness, our default is to focus on someone else's response. And what God is saying is we've got to flip that. I've heard it said that unforgiveness is like drinking poison yourself while waiting on the other person to die. We need to first focus on glorifying God and what he calls us to do in the relationship, not on how someone else responds or what they are doing. See, when we've been hurt or wronged, how do we glorify God in that situation? Here's a couple ways. First, we glorify God by trusting, obeying, and imitating God himself. By trusting, obeying, and imitating God. We glorify God, as Romans 15, 7 says, by welcoming one another as Christ has welcomed us for the glory of God. When we've been betrayed, we must trust that God's way of forgiveness is better than our way of fostering resentment. And how did God act? If we are to imitate him, how did he act when he had been betrayed by us? Well, in love, he sent his son, Jesus, to die an obedient death on the cross for the very sake of the people who had wronged him, betrayed him, slandered him, lied about him, and mistreated him. And in the very process, Jesus himself declared, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We glorify God by trusting his way of forgiveness, obeying his command to forgive, and then imitating God by forgiving others. Second, we glorify God by bringing our emotions under control of the spirit. It's one of the hardest ones. By bringing our emotions under control of the Holy Spirit rather than having our emotions be in control by the flesh. See, without the spirit, inevitably, when we've been hurt, we're gonna be left with anger and with bitterness and resentment. And to some extent in the flesh, that is not only completely understandable, it's justifiably so. But dare I say that forgiveness is near impossible without the Spirit's intervention. Because when you submit your emotions to the Spirit, I want to tell you, it's not me just being Pentecostal or something, miracles can happen. Listen, just even this morning, right off the bat, very practically, there may be a husband and wife here this weekend. And you might not even be sitting together. Maybe you are sitting together, but your hearts are so far apart and you are so angry with one another. You're separated one, from one another because of somebody's betrayal or somebody's sin. And what I want you to hear, the beautiful message of Philemon, the beautiful message of the gospel is a reminder that if you are in Christ, then that which God calls for in forgiveness, he also provides by means of the Spirit. The message of the gospel means that God, through the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, can enable you to look into the eyes of the one you have offended and say, I am so sorry, and I am asking for your forgiveness. And at the very same time, God can enable the one who has been offended to say, and I forgive you from the deepest recesses of my heart. And then for each of you from that moment forward, when you seek to glorify God in your relationship and submit your emotions to the power of the spirit in your forgiveness toward one another, you can each now draw on the resources of God's grace in your lives and actually be reconciled to one another. We glorify God when our emotions are under the control of the spirit, not the flesh. And then lastly, we glorify God when we truly believe that God can change anyone. This is what Paul refers to in verse 10 when he says, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. In other words, he says, Philemon, you remember Onesimus? The one you know as thief and as a rebel, he's become a Christian. Church, if we wanna glorify God in forgiveness, we must believe as hard as it can be to fathom when we're thinking about certain people that God really can change anyone that in Christianity, there's no such thing as a hopeless case. So the first question forgiveness should ask is whether we're focused primarily on God and then we move to ourselves. Again, the order of this is important. So actually help me out, repeat after me. Say first God, then me. First God, then me. So the second question we should consider then is this, 
what are the logs in my eye? What are the logs in my eye? If you're not familiar with this teaching, this is a teaching that Jesus gave the disciples when he's talking about forgiveness over in Matthew 7. And look at what Jesus says. He says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's still a log in your own eye? Jesus goes so far, he says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. When my wife and I were engaged, um, we did premarital counseling with actually a number of different counselors because we had just gotten saved. We had a whole bunch of sin in our past. We were like, we need all the Jesus advice y'all can give us, okay? And so every single counseling session, individually, not related to one another, every single one of them brought us to this at some point in our counseling sessions to say, hey, there's gonna be plenty of moments in marriage where you can see the other speck, but you need to get the log out of your own eye. See, when it comes to forgiveness, we are not developing a plan to justify our resentment. I'm not here to give you a strategy to win or to to overcome the other person in your argument. What we are planning to do is to fix our eyes on Jesus and then search our own hearts to examine any wrongdoing on our part. And if any is found, then we should confess In fact, even in a major conflict, even the most minor confessions can actually have a softening effect on the offender's heart. I mean, again, just think about this within the context of Philemon and Onesimus. Has Philemon been wronged? Absolutely. But I want you to think about when Onesimus returns and knocks on his door as a brother in Christ, what impact would it have on him if Philemon not only forgave him, but when he opened the door, he actually began by saying, Onesimus, hey, I forgive you. And we definitely need to unpack and process that. But first, I actually need to ask for your forgiveness because I've had a log in my eye. I never should have put you in the position of being a slave in the first place. Because Philemon, as a Christian, never should have owned human beings made in the image of God as slaves. Full stop. That's it. See, when logs are truly brought into contact with living Christianity, it will always destroy your log. This is why, for instance, again, in this context, the Bible doesn't have to confront the institution of slavery. Rather, it can undercut it by encouraging believers to look at brothers and sisters who deserve love and grace and compassion rather than as property. And when that happens, when we can look at one another in that way as made in the image of God, what's gonna happen is that the institution will fall by its own weight. So I've gotta ask, has your log been brought into contact with living Christianity? I wanna be clear, you might not have played a role at all in the offense that occurred. But now out of anger and a desire for revenge to get back at the person who hurts you, that's actually become the log in your eye. Yes, because of how deeply they hurt you, but now you think that the only way you're gonna feel better is to inflict some kind of vengeance or guilt upon that person. Or maybe for you, it's much more passive. Maybe your log is the way that you use your words toward the person that hurts you. You're wounded, so you just hurl back hurtful words and sarcasm and grumbling and complaining and lies and exaggerations. And you even slander them all because they deserve it. Or perhaps your log is your actions or attitude toward the offender. That since then you've become just apathetic in the relationship or purposefully negligent or passive aggressive or critical, or you withhold mercy and forgiveness toward them. I remember when Pastor Brian preached here about five years ago, well before he was on staff, and one of the things he said that stuck with me is he said, let's not make the error of thinking that God loves you more than he loves the person who has wronged you. Before we approach someone, we've got to examine ourselves and remember we all have our own locks, that none of us are perfect. And humbling ourselves and remembering that will help us pursue forgiveness on the grounds of God's grace that has been shown towards us all people. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And so now that our eyes are on Jesus, we've removed any logs from our eye. It is now time to turn our focus on the offender. And so here's the third question that forgiveness should ask. Do I need to overlook this or do I need to confront this? Do I need to overlook 
or confront. See, we see this even in our story because on the one hand, Onesimus must be confronted with what he's done. That's why in verse 12, Paul sends him back to Philemon. He needs to confront what he's done. He needs to tell the truth about it. On the other hand, Paul is asking Philemon to overlook the fact that Onesimus stole from him because Paul will actually pay back himself what's been stolen. That's what we see in verse 18. He says, if he's wronged you at all or owes you anything, Paul says, charge that to my account. And when I read this, especially if I'm in the middle of a situation trying to figure out whether I should confront or overlook, I almost get frustrated because I'm like, well, which is it, Paul? When when someone hurts us or wounds us or lies about us or injures us or makes a mockery of us, am I to overlook that sin or am I to confront that sin? Which one is it, Paul? And then a basic Bible reading principle is that we interpret harder verses, maybe like this one, in light of easier ones. And so maybe I use my cross references and I call up some friends. I'm like, hey, do you have any Bible verses about forgiveness? And they point me to some other places and I go looking around in the Bible. But then I read stuff like, Proverbs 19, 11, it's to a man's glory to overlook an offense. So I'm like, okay, I should overlook it. But then on the other hand, I read all the gospels and Jesus is telling us over and over, if anyone sins against us, we're to confront and rebuke them. And so I end up by saying, which is it, Paul? Like, which is it, Bible? Am I to confront or am I to overlook? Let me jump to the punchline. There's a time for both. And it takes discernment and wisdom and community to know which is best. So first, let's look at where the Bible tells us to overlook. Here's how I'd sum this up. Here's when to overlook an offense. First, we should overlook an offense when it is purely a matter of preference, okay? I'm not trying to be lighthearted here, but when it's just flat something that annoys you, (laughs) maybe somebody does something in a different way than you would prefer them to do it, you don't need to confront that every time, okay? When she wants the dishes put away a certain way, just put them away a certain way. Don't argue about it, okay? Just, just get it done. It's fine. It might be something that annoys you, but it's not a sin. We need to learn. Again, this is part of putting our emotions under control of the spirit. We need to learn how to bifurcate our preferences from objective right and wrong, all right? So we overlook an offense when it's just a matter of preference. Second, we overlook an offense when it has not permanently damaged the relationship, Overlook when it hasn't permanently damaged a relationship. In other words, another way you could ask this is, if this behavior continues, will it have long-term ramifications? If it seems to just be a one-off thing, then we should probably overlook it. If it tends to be a patterned behavior, that's probably something we need to confront, okay? So if it has not, or doesn't have the potential of damaging a long-term relationship, I'd say overlook the offense, Third, we overlook when it's not hurting the offender themselves. As believers, we're called to encourage and to look after one another. If someone's sin or even just stupidity isn't hurting them, we probably should just overlook it as long as it's not a pattern that's going to hurt them or someone else, which is the last one. We should overlook when it has not hurt other people, okay? If the offense falls into one of these categories, there is a time to overlook. Again, it takes discernment and wisdom and community to discern this, but we see this all through Proverbs, the book of wisdom. I already read Proverbs 19, 11. It's to a man's glory to overlook an offense. There's also Proverbs 11, verse 12, which says, whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. Remain silent is just another way of saying a man of understanding overlooks the offense. Or how about about Proverbs chapter 17, verse nine? Says, whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter, repeats a matter could also be said, gossips about it, separates close friends. We're gonna come back to the second part of that verse, but the first part, whoever covers an offense seeks love. This is important because cover doesn't mean just sweeping it under the rug and pretending it never happened and never doing anything about it. Cover means to absorb the cost. Think of it like going out to eat with friends and someone covers the meal, okay? Went out to an awesome restaurant the other night and a buddy, when the bill came before it even hit the table, he had already paid for it. He has absorbed the debt that I have incurred toward the restaurant and he has covered the cost of that meal. Forgiving someone by overlooking is the process of covering a debt that is owed and declaring a pardon. 
It's forgiving what another person owes you. It's sacrificing what you deserve, forgiveness, repentance, reconciliation for the sake of the other and the relationship. It's putting down the scorecard and overlooking the offense. Yes, which means that forgiveness, especially overlooking something, is its own form of suffering. And I know this is hard, but doing this sometimes is the only way to stop the cycle of retribution because you no longer need what the other person has coming to them. There are times it's just unwise to confront and it's better to overlook. But brothers and sisters, let's remember that Jesus calls us to be peacemakers, not simply peacekeepers. There are times when peacemaking requires overlooking an offense, but there's also times when it requires confronting an offense. And so as followers of Christ, the question we have to ask ourselves is, have I truly forgiven this person and overlooked their offense and moved on from it? Or have I just allowed the passage of time to falsely cover a multitude of sins that have not actually been dealt with? that you've just swept everything under the rug and you've done it under the guise of overlooking the offense and keeping the peace because you're actually scared to confront and do the hard work of reconciliation that Jesus calls us to. Again, there are biblically wise times to overlook an offense, but there are also times you need to confront. Otherwise, your reconciliation is going to be a cheap reconciliation that won't last because you're just brushing something under the rug in order to maintain peace rather than be a peacemaker. So let's look at where the Bible tells us we should confront. Okay, Luke chapter 17, verse three. Jesus says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. In other words, let's go back through our grid of overlooking. If your brother or sister has dishonored God, when their sin has the possibility of permanently damaging the relationship, if their sin is hurting themselves, or if their sin is hurting other people, namely you, you are called to confront and rebuke them. You confront them. Or if it's dangerous for you to confront them directly, then someone else does it. But regardless, the lesson stands that love always confronts harmful behavior. When people are being hurt, it is not loving to let them keep doing what they are doing in the name of keeping the peace. Again, this is why biblically speaking, we should never simply overlook abuse in the name of Jesus. When people are being hurt, it is not loving to look the other way. It's what we've been seeing in Psalm 23. Jesus, the good shepherd, what does he carry? He carries a rod and a staff. A rod and a staff are not objects for cuddling, right? These are tools used to protect the sheep. And that's what he calls us to do as the body of Christ as well. Why? Look at Proverbs chapter 27, verse six. Because faithful, your version might say trustworthy, are the wounds of a friend. It says, Christians, we confront for the sake of freedom in our own hearts and for the sake of the offender. Because Lord willing, the offender will then grow and look more like Jesus by overcoming something that they're dealing with that has caused the sin in the first place. Now, what I don't want to do, I feel like this entire message could just be caveat on caveat on caveat, but what I don't want to do is paint this picture as rainbows and butterflies. As someone hurts you, you confront them, they repent, you forgive, you hug, and y'all are besties for the rest of your life. You need to know that when you confront sin, it does not always end well. In fact, when you confront and address someone else's sin and their only response is defensive or minimizing or blame shifting, that means that the other person is not repentant and you are actually free to step back from that relationship. At that point, you have done what God has called you to do. And so hear me, forgiveness does not mean that you have to stay friends with someone. There is a time to walk away. You remember Romans chapter 12, verse 18 that Pastor Brian shared with us a couple weeks ago? Romans 12, 18 says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. What that means is sometimes you and I try our best and it simply doesn't work because you cannot have a healthy relationship with someone who refuses to repent. 
You cannot have a healthy relationship with someone who refuses to repent, nor can you have a healthy relationship with someone who refuses to show grace to you even when you have acknowledged that you're wrong and you are trying to repent. You cannot have reconciliation without forgiveness, but you can have forgiveness without reconciliation. And it takes wisdom and discernment and community to help you determine when to overlook first, when to confront. And so last note on this, and we'll get to our last question here, but specifically on that community part. Proverbs also tells us that there is wisdom and actually safety in an abundance of counselors, in an abundance of community. What that means is it is good and wise to have others who can help you sift through your situation, including literal counseling, okay? What community discernment does not mean is that you go around repeating a matter or gossiping about it. Remember Proverbs 17, 9? It says when he who repeats a matter or gossips about it separates close friends. What this means in community is we don't seek to hurt others like they have hurt us by going around and talking about them. We don't slander others even when they've done us wrong. This also means maybe you're not the offended or the offender, but you are somebody else in that community. This also means don't be the person who allows someone to slander or gossip to you about somebody else when what they should be doing is working it out with the very person that they're talking about, okay? In fact, here's four very practical promises one must truly make to forgive. Four promises one must make to truly forgive. I know I'm giving you a ton here, but my hope is that the spirit just takes some of this and implants it so deep into your heart and that you can experience the freedom of of forgiveness. I get these four things from a great little book called Peacemaking for Families that my wife and I were recommended from one of our counselors when we were in counseling at one of the multiple times in our lives. And so to truly forgive someone for what they've done, you got to promise, number one, I will not think about it. Number two, I will not bring it up and use it against you. Number three, I will not talk to others about it. And number four, I will not allow it to stand between us or hinder our personal relationship. By the power of the spirit, I won't think about it. I won't bring it up or use it against you. I won't talk to others about it. And I'm not gonna let it stand between us and our personal relationship. Through discernment and community and wisdom, and most importantly, the Spirit's guidance, you either overlook and move on, or you confront, you deal with it, which may mean lots of time and lots of counseling, and then you move on. Which leads me to the last question that forgiveness asks Am I truly open to reconciliation in this relationship? This might be the hardest question of all. I mean, even in our book here, I want you to really think about what Paul is asking of Philemon, which is the same thing God asks of us. Look at verse 17. Paul says, so Philemon, if you consider me your partner, receive Onesimus as you would receive me. What he's saying is that when Onesimus knocks on your door, you should greet him and treat him as if it were me, Paul. He's saying, I want you to consider having a relationship with Onesimus that is stronger post-offense than it was pre-offense because he is now a brother in Christ. We have to ask ourselves is whether we are truly open to reconciliation in the relationship if the offender really is repentant. Now, again, what I'm not saying is that you completely forget anything that happened. That's both impossible and naive. God himself does not passively forget our sins. He actively chooses not to remember them. I'm also not saying that forgiveness is excusing their sin. The very fact that forgiveness is necessary indicates again, that somebody has done something wrong and inexcusable. What I'm saying is that forgiveness is an act of the will that is empowered by the Holy Spirit that comes in response to the grace that we ourselves have received. It's a conscious decision powered by the Holy Spirit to fully and freely pardon our offender. That when we forgive one another, we are breaking down the walls that has arisen between us and it opens the way for the possibility of a reconciled relationship. Forgiveness is an act of the will empowered by the Holy Spirit in response to the grace that we ourselves have received. So the only question I have left is are you ready to experience the freedom of forgiveness? Who 
right now do you need to forgive? Who have you been thinking about this entire message? Who right now does the thought of reconciliation seem not only impossible, but actually intolerable to you? Because listen, I want to be loving and careful and pastoral here, but some of you are so hurt and you are so angry and probably rightfully so, but that resentment is poisoning your soul. You've been drinking this poison, waiting on the other person to die for so long that bitterness and anger are controlling you. And I'm telling you today, in Jesus' name, you need to get rid of it because it's killing you. I say this as lovingly yet as clearly as I can. You don't have to be controlled by this anymore. As a Christian, you no longer have to ask, how much forgiveness do they deserve? The question you can now ask is, how much freedom do I desire? See, only Jesus can give you the ability to let it go. In order to begin even thinking about forgiving someone else, you must first receive the forgiveness that God has shown you in Christ. And that comes by surrendering to his plan, by letting him have control. And when you do that, that's when you can begin the path to experiencing the freedom of forgiveness. In other words, that horizontal relationship will never be resolved until the vertical one is established first. Let's never forget, we will never forgive anyone as much as God in Christ has already forgiven us. And to the extent that we are unwilling to forgive that person reveals how much we have minimized our offenses against God and have maximized someone else's offenses against us. For Jesus, the price to forgive us was his life. We owed a sin debt that we were unable to pay, but when Jesus died on the cross, my sins were then put on his account and he was treated how I should have been treated. But the good news of the gospel is that when I trusted him as savior, his righteousness was put on my account. So now God accepts me in Christ Jesus. Therefore, if you've been redeemed by the blood of Christ and reconciled to God because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we are to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Can we bow our heads? Who is God calling you to forgive? What's keeping you from showing grace towards someone else today? How much freedom do you desire today? That feeling in your stomach right now, it might even be anger toward me for telling you that you should walk this path of forgiveness that is the Holy Spirit working on you, wanting you to experience that freedom. I would say don't resist the present convictions of the Holy Spirit. And so God, right now, I just pray there are no other words that I can give that are gonna break these bonds, both the bond to forgive and the bond to repent. God, I pray that any relational chains that we came in here with, God, that you would break them and we would be free to walk forward in the joy and the peace that we can only experience in Christ. Holy Spirit, take over our hearts take over our lives, take over our relationships. And God, would we truly learn to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as you have forgiven us in Christ. God, I pray, I ask, I beg in Jesus' name. Amen.
If more of you means less of me, take everything. Guess all of you is all I need. Take everything. You are my life and my treasure. The one that I can't live without. Here at your feet, my desires and dreams. heaven say that if more of you means take care whatever's not 
not pleasing in your will, Jesus. Yes, all of you. I surrender it all. I give it all to you. Take every. One more time, no music. Sing it, church. If more of you means. Yeah. Take every. Father, I stretch my hand. Yes, all of you. to go home, but I heard this as I was singing it. Oh, I surrender. Sometimes it's hard to say that from your heart, but if you really feel that, say, all to thee, my blessed. joining us this morning. Before you go, I want to remind you that we have a live host team ready and willing to pray with you this morning. All you have to do is click request prayer. If you're not watching live, you can submit a prayer request through our Summit app or by emailing prayer at summitchurch.com. Please don't leave this moment without allowing us to approach the throne of grace together. Or maybe today's message is stirring something in your heart and you are ready to begin a relationship with Jesus. If that's you, we would love to walk with you through that process. Just text the word READY to 33933 and someone from our team will help you take that next step with Jesus. Summit family, you are sent.